my episode last Friday, I began to share with whoever's been following me what I found to be a powerful, mystical experience for which I have no explanation whatsoever. And I, there is no scientific verification of what happened to me or why it happened to me, but uh, I still muse about it a lot, trying to unpack it and figure out what the hell that was all about. And uh, whether I was just having some momentary psychotic delusion of what was going on or whether I'd really had that experience. But since my wife was with me, she keeps uh, corroborating that what happened happened. So I will continue and just finish telling the story. It's the story about a visit to my father's grave. He had died, uh, to recapitulate a little from last week, he, he had died when I was 12. And uh, I went to his funeral some days later and had never returned to the graveside over all the years intervening. I was 45, I think I said, when I decided it was time to go again. Uh, by that time, we had moved to Southern California. I had been nowhere near Western Pennsylvania at all, uh, where he was buried. And I had found no reason to go there. But as I got older and older, he had died at 48, and I was now 45. As so many males do, I don't know if it's limited to males, but I know I've heard this from male clients. Uh, we get frightened as we approach the age of our father's death, that somehow we're not going to be able to outlive them, and that death may be lurking and waiting for us very soon, too. So... I was having sour preoccupations with that, even though my health was good. And somehow it occurred to me, I needed to go to my father's grave and talk to him. I had had some conversations with him in imagination up until then, but I thought the, the vividness of it uh, would be actually return to his grave where his final remains are interred. So I asked my wife to come. She agreed and we made plans and found our way to Pittsburgh because he's buried in a place called Versailles Township, about 30, 45 minute drive outside of downside, downtown Pittsburgh. Finding the cemetery proved, proved itself to be a challenge and a mystical one because I had been given the name of the cemetery by my only really aged uh, relative I still had who had attended his funeral, and she had given me the wrong name. She had misremembered, misremembered it, and I was just fumbling around trying to find out what to do. I finally drove out to Versailles Township, where the cemetery was, and I decided I would just explore. I, I knew that I could see the valley of the Allegheny River uh, from the graveside. And I had been, the road drove along the Allegheny, which then bent uh, in a different direction. And there was a road up, uh, up away from the, the state highway, up onto a hill. And I thought if I went up the hill, maybe up there, the missing cemetery could be found. And sure enough, I zigged and zagged, went up to the top of the hill and over the crest. And there was the Temple B'nai Israel Cemetery, a Jewish cemetery out in the boondocks. And uh, I, I was sure that that was the right cemetery. I, we parked inside and I walked unerringly to my father's grave without missing a turn, missing a beat. I oriented on where I thought I'd be able to see the river from. And in doing that, it took me directly to his grave. And uh, that's where I think I stopped. I had been reading from the story I'd written about this in my book. So I'll pick up reading again. I noticed that there was a small American flag stuck in the urn in front of my father's headstone. I remembered that he had been a member of the VFW in Duquesne, the town where I was born ongoing and for years after uh, mustering out of from World War I. I imagine that he was still on their roster and that they made sure to honor him at special times. I noticed the headstone. It was a double one. His name and date of birth and death were on the left side 
my mother's name and date of birth, but not the date of death, had already been engraved on the right side in 1944, but she was not there. That grave was empty. Poor dad. My mother's parents and my father's widow sister were next to my father, their graves and headstones in a row behind him. I began to sob and did so for some minutes. Then my non-Jewish Jewishness asserted itself, and I mumbled whatever I could remember of the Kaddish, the ceremonial prayer for the dead. By this time, Hermine had taken my arm and was keeping me steady, quiet company. The ritual of praying to the God in whom I do not believe freed me somehow. Imagery began to tumble through my consciousness. I imagined that my father was present somehow. He was living alone in a grand residence that had been constructed somewhere in the earth below. I knew the image was both real and unreal. In imagination, I began to speak to him in person, but in private, accompanied by shadowy depictions of him I was also creating. I had to come see you. I've been afraid of dying. So much has happened to me since your funeral. I grew up. It was hard, but it turned out okay. I didn't become an entrepreneur like you. I am very different. I became a psychologist. That's the one good thing about your dying young. We never had to fight. And I think we would have fought a lot about what I should or shouldn't do with my life. You wanted me to take over for you. And I wasn't even interested. The rest of having to grow up without you was awful though. Your wife, my mother, moved to Los Angeles a year and a half after you died. I finished my trip to adulthood there. She married two more times before she died at 68 for pancreatic cancer. She's buried in a crypt in Los Angeles, far away from here. Her other marriages weren't very good ones, but I don't think yours with her was very good either. The second lasted nine years and ended in divorce. The third, much later marriage, lasted three years and her older husband, a, a man she probably married for financial security, died of cancer after that brief time. The two of you never did very well together. Your partnership seemed proper enough, but rather empty to me. I never saw you exchange any affectionate gesture with each other. Your middle child, Marion, and I have both heard some gossip over the years. You used to go to Kansas City periodically for some kind of business while we were growing up. Around the fringes of the family, it's whispered that you had a redheaded woman in Kansas City who was in love with you. I came today to tell you that I found myself hoping that the whispers were true. I've always wished you had more love, more lightness in your life than you were able to find with my mother. It's terrible seeing your last resting place. The cemetery itself is beautiful, but I'm appalled at how trapped you are. You're surrounded by some of your relatives and in-laws, but all of them are persons who helped kill you. Even when I was small, I watched how driven you were at work. I've come to understand that your life that I was observing was an impossible one. You had to earn enough to support yourself, my mother, and your children, your aging parents, your mother and father-in-law, your widowed sister and her children, and our maid, Anna. Being responsible for providing for all 14 of us must have been overwhelming and poisonous for you. You had a business that demanded so much, production, and sales process, processes, employee trouble, and you had to do all of it day after day without much love or much human warmth. <clears throat> from anyone. I watched you age and go gray, but you were a man of honor. Divorce was not an option. Neither was telling one or more of the cast of characters you were supporting that you couldn't be responsible for them any longer. In some ways, your death has always seemed to me to be a disguised suicide. You discovered at last that death was the only possible way that you could allow yourself to get out. That was the end of my first soliloquy, one I imagined as some kind of dialogue with the shade of my father. 
And while I was talking to my father in my imagination, I was also envisioning him listening, nodding his head in agreement, pacing back and forth as he absorbed my words. Someone agitated, and at last with tears in his eyes. I saw him shed tears of love and appreciation for me and for my visit. And I began to experience that I had slowly been moving internally, becoming his brother or even his father and not his child any longer. I told Hermine that I was finished, at least for the moment. She remarked that the cemetery was lovely. The day was beautiful. Why didn't we walk around and explore it a little? And so we did. We followed a path deeper into the cemetery and into rows of graves from years and years earlier. At the very back, close to the brow of the hill that tumbled down towards the Agagheni, we saw the oldest graves with dates from 1864. We wandered, wandered among the headstones, working our way slowly back towards my father's grave on the, on the path. We saw the whole history of more than 100 years of Jewish immigration to the townships of the Monongahela Valley, the history written in the markings on the gravestones. There was a profusion of Central and Eastern European Jewish names on the markers. So many tragedies were implied by the abundance of little grave markers carrying the names of children that had died in infancy. Imposing family gravestones that must have been very affluent were in abundance too. Uh, those rich families were buried there. Their material success clearly shown by the many grave sites in close proximity that had resplendent markers, each containing a different first name attached to the shared surname. Slowly we worked my, our way back to my father. On our walk, I picked up a pebble. There is a Jewish tradition that if one get, visits a grave, it is expected that the visitors mark and honor the visit by leaving a stone atop the grave marker. When we arrived at the headstone, I placed the pebble on it and discovered that I had more I wanted to say to Martin Kovacs. I summed up his image and began anew. I motioned to my wife that she should stop and wait. I'm back after a walk. I haven't introduced you yet to my wife. Her name's Hermine. She's my second wife. I had a stupid, miserable early first marriage, but that's not why I stopped uh, to visit you again. I want to tell you when, what my adolescence was like without you. Uh, <clears throat> that until I, the, that the moment Marion told me you were dead, I went numb. All my capacity to feel much was crushed, not really dead, but crushed for the time being. I knew your life was terrible, so I generated a belief that you had somehow managed to buy a corpse somewhere. Cunningly, you had substituted someone else's body for your, your own so that you could sneak away from your life. Your corpse in the funeral parlor was made up terribly anyhow, so it was easy to play with the daydream that it wasn't really you who was lying in the open coffin. I used to pretend to myself all during my teen years that after I had become a man at last and had moved out of home, I'd be walking down the street one day and would feel a tap on my shoulder. I would turn around and it would be you. You would tell me about your escape and where and how you had been living. You would swear me to secrecy, but if I were willing to hold the fact of your new life and confidence, I could rejoin you in it and go on living with you as my father. I kept you alive in other ways as well. I stole some things from your bedroom when mom wasn't looking. I took two packs of camels, one of your pipes, and a partly full can of Prince Albert tobacco. I also stole a pair of your shoes. In the night when I knew it wouldn't be caught, I'd go down into the basement, clomp around with your shoes on my feet, they were much too big for me, and light up something to smoke. I'd fight coughing and try to draw the smoke deeply into my lungs. My fantasy was that the smoke was your essence, that I was drawing it deeply into me. And with the smoke in my lungs and shoes on my feet, I was merging with your soul. We were united and would never have to be separate, at least not until a day might come when I could let you go. 
My God, did I cry. I felt ashamed, the 45-year-old man who was once again 12 years old, but now in the fullness of grief once again, the grief I had not been able to allow myself 33 years earlier. Hermine put her arm around me as had been her wont, and after a while I became calm and told her it was time to leave. We walked to the parking lot and to our rental car. I reached into all my pockets in an increasing frenzy. I had misplaced the car keys. I've always believed that my present wife is a good witch, some kind of combination of the Hermine in Herman Hesse's novel Steppenwolf and the kind, of, the kind witch played by Billy Burke in The Wizard of Oz. She smiled at my distress and said simply, you need to go back to the grave, come on. We went back, sure enough, the keys had fallen behind my father's gravestone. And I imagined talking to him again. I'm sorry I didn't say goodbye. And dad, I love you much more today than I ever did when you were alive. Back we went to the car. I unlocked the door. We seated ourselves and put on seat belts. I put the key into the ignition and turned it. There was no sound, no response. The starter did not whir. Deadness. What the fuck exploded out of me? Was the battery dead? No, the lights worked and sh sure looked very brightly. The radio came on easily. The wipers were fine. Turning them all on together and draining the battery even more was no problem. It wasn't the battery. I next tried to see if it were the electrical connection in the shift lever that was the problem. So I jiggled the, the shifter, nothing. I tried putting it in neutral rather than in park to see if I could start it that way. No good either. So my good wish solved the problem. There's something more you need to do with your father. He's not letting you leave. An answer. I sat quietly for about 10 seconds and then simply spoke out loud the thought that had risen in me. It's okay, dad, I'll come back and visit you again when it feels like the right time. I tried turning the ignition, ignition key again. The car sprang to life, starter whirring and engine catching fire. We drove away, headed for the airport. I was very quiet, trying to assimilate it and without any access to make any success to make sense, some sense whatsoever about the experiences I had been having. We turned in the rental car and took the shuttle to the curb in front of the TWA counter. I brought our baggage to the Skycap and checked them onto the aircraft. He asked for my tickets and ticket envelope. I took them out of my pocket and handed them to him. He put tags on our luggage and stopped and, and stapled them to the envelope. As I finished the tip, I fished the tip for out of pocket, I noted the time. I don't think we need to hurry. I don't know how far the gate is in time. I think, I do think we need to hurry. I don't know how far away the gate is and time's getting a little short. We rushed into the terminal. I went up to the ticket counter to get the boarding passes and the, and the clerk asked for our tickets. I reached into my breast pocket. The envelope containing them was not there. I panicked again, petting all of my pockets frantically. Don't worry, why don't you run back to the sky cap? You probably left the tickets on his counter, uh, Hermine advised me. I did so, but couldn't find either the sky cap or his cart. Hermine had come out of the building after me to check on me. I threw up my hands in despair, signaling to her that the tickets were nowhere to be found. She looked at me and did it again. There must be something else you need to say to your father. I didn't argue. After a moment, I spoke aloud with enough volume that passersby could overhear me. All right, dad, I give up. I'll not only come back, but next time I'll bring your grandchildren to meet you too. A few minutes later, a voice came over the airport loudspeakers. Would the Kovacs party come to the TWA customer service counter? Your tickets have been found and turned in. We left Pittsburgh and returned home to Los Angeles as we, as we had been scheduled to do. 
and the sights, sounds, events, and my inner experiences of those days have continued to reverberate in me over the years. I kept my word. I brought Hermine and my two stepdaughters to my father's grave four years later. And four years after that, I took my adopted daughter from my first marriage to have the same experience with me. Did all of this make me believe that there was a deity shaping the events? No. Did I think my father's spirit was alive somewhere, somehow, and was creating both the turbulence we experienced and was providing the magical solutions that it surfaced? No. Can I formulate any explanation whatsoever for the incidents that took place those days? No. Do I need any explanation? No. What is much more important to me is my appreciation for the ongoing evolution of my own self-awareness, my search to grasp and to express the fullness of my being. My whole life is a journey out of darkness and towards more light. Those days in Pittsburgh and in Versailles Township were a great step forward. My admiration and appreciation for my wife expanded enormously. But most of all, my relationship with Martin Kovacs, my father, was worked and reworked in precious ways. And the intermittent mourning that needs to go on across an entire life with it when a loss has been too early and too painful took its next steps forward. I am a movie lover. There's a marvelous film made early in the career of and featuring a very young Gene Ackman. I never sang for my father. The plot turns on the struggle a man in early middle age is enduring in the attempt to make some kind of emotional contact with a very detached, proper, and non-emotional father who is getting elderly and may soon be gone. What is particularly telling for me is some early moments in the film, the moments when the opening credits are rolling. As they scroll down the screen, we hear a narrator and a voiceover intoning, Death does not end a relationship, it only changes it. And those film watchers who keep these words in mind as they watch the story unfold, may come to appreciate that all of us are being invited by the screenwriter to witness this attempt to come to terms with a powerful piece of the author's own and maybe our history. For me too then, the death of Martin Kovacs did not end my relationship with him. That relationship continues and it remains a precious part of my consciousness now into my 90s. The working and reworking of it will not end until I die or will it end even then? All right, that's the end of that piece. Why don't you guys come up out of your muting and say whatever you say about that before I go on to something else. Arthur, as you were uh, talking about um, the uh, occasion of um, of uh, living, um, or, or or kind of like uh, uh, living as long as your father, I, I recall that there was um, a professor of mine in professional roles who announced <laughs> during uh, one of our classes that he had achieved that milestone. Oh, yes, that was me. <laughs> I must have turned 49. I had finished my 48th year. <laughs> and and, uh, and I, I think it was a momentous occasion that you shared with the class. It certainly was for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wasn't doomed to follow my father's fate. He wasn't an avenging person because I displeased him by not having become an entrepreneur and he was going to make sure he was going to kill me. <laughs> no, yes, I felt freed. So I just remembered that. So I wanted to let you know. Oh, thank you. That's a gift you're giving me. <laughs> yeah, I think it really also demonstrates the uh, the way through grief for people is is so unique that uh, any kind of ritual, it's really up to the person to try to kind of figure the way forward through things like that, and it never ends. Mm. I haven't been impelled uh, to go back and visit his grave in recent years. Uh, 
that need to be there has passed out of me. But I, every once in a while, I still remember him. I still have some imagined conversations with him. And, and mainly, he has become uh, quite childlike in some ways. I, I see the hidden child in him that never lived well. And I feel very parental when I visit with him. It's like I, I have matured into eras of life that he never had a chance to visit or stretch himself into. He got cut off very young. 48 is only coming into the beginning of the fullness of what is possible. Oh, that's another craziness that I, I've had. Uh, sometimes I, I've had daydreams of disinterring my mother and having whatever bigger remains are still inside that coffin shipped to Western Pennsylvania and putting her, uh, reburying her in the where the gravestone is and then having the, having the correct uh, <laughs> date of her death chiseled into it. And then they would be residing side by side and maybe they could grow the capacity to care about each other finally. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some things are fixable only after death. Mm -hmm. huh. I keep denying that the all ends and only blackness comes after death. I, I have, I, I have wonderful daydreams of uh, all these things that are going to happen after death, and I laugh at myself, knowing it's horseshit that I'm generating. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> You, you, on, you know, on an infinite on an infinite timeline on an infinite timeline all things are kind of possible <laughs> that's true and in an infinite universe that has an infinite number of other universes that it contains right exactly it's, that's the law of large numbers yeah you also reminded me arthur when you had um put the um uh um uh the pebble or the the stone on your father's uh gravestone tombstone yeah and and, uh, and um it reminded me of uh the movie uh, schindler's list yeah and everybody who schindler saved was walking you know past his uh grave and and putting a a, a stone and, and out of appreciation your words are making me cry. I remember that scene. <laughs> Every time I watch that movie again, I start bawling. Uh, that's a beautiful story because he was, he was nothing but a, a shallow con artist who was forced by circumstances to rescue people. <laughs> uh. Uh, see, one of the wonderful things about having a Hungarian heritage is you cry very easily about anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh. but, but I was made to think that, that you know, like the, the stone that you provided for your father was out of appreciation. Yes. I, I wanted to leave a lasting trace on uh, at his grave that I had finally made it there and was and, and was going to come back again. I've been a member of the Sierra Club for a long time, and uh, funny enough, that's a Sierra Club tradition too. It's not putting pebbles on on. Uh, gravestones but when you come to a fork in a road uh, you pick up a pebble and you put it on the side of the fork that you've taken to let other travelers know that many people have gone this way and there are lots of pebbles around for people who have turned in <laughs> any particular direction and the Sierra Club was founded by John Muir and he was not a Jew as a matter of fact, he was a terrible anti-Semite. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys are not telling me why the car wouldn't start and why the tickets got lost. <laughs> 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 uh. 
what's the matter with you? You must have some scientific explanation for why those things happen. <laughs> yeah, you know, intermittent connectivity with electronics is common. Probably had a loose uh, positive wire on the battery. <laughs> <laughs> as, the, as the day went on, the, uh, the temperature increased, the metal expanded. And, and oh, that's so, right, okay. I can that's do a it. Good one. <laughs> Thank you. I gave myself the answer to the other one too. The uh, uh, the bellman, not the bellman, the, uh, the the bagman noticed that I had left the ticket on his counter, and he didn't know if I was coming back. So he thought that he should take it to the uh, traveling desk where they would make an mm -hmm. announcement over the loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. That's why he wasn't there, and that's why there was no ticket. He was taking and turning it in properly. <laughs> There. Yeah. Now we've solved oh, so, the mystery. So boring. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasted my time going back to the grave those other times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fulfilling the commitment I had made to him. Mm -hmm. Actually, he was quite neglectful. He wasn't paying any attention to my being there any more than he paid much attention to me while I was growing up. <laughs> that was all my longing to have a father who was paying attention to me. Yeah. But it seemed like you wanted to make sure you did everything that you could possibly do. Um, yeah. To say goodbye. Yeah. to tell him about the meaning of his life for me, the growing appreciation I had grown for his lot in life because I wasn't able to think about that at all when I was a kid. And to, to say anything I wanted him to know that I hadn't had a chance to tell him in real life. Somehow it was very meaningful to him to, to, to tell him how I, to use psychoanalytic terms, I incorporated him. I wanted his shoes on and I wanted to bring his smoke into my being. I, I really didn't want to separate from him. I tried to fight against it somehow by fusing with him in that crazy fantasy. But he should have a parent die before they're 35. gets easier with each advancing year, but it's still terrible before 35. You're not quite ready enough. All right, I'm gonna ask the two of you to bear witness uh, and give me forbearance because I'm gonna uh, read you something I've already read to our group. And uh, it's on the theme of my struggling with mortality, fear of dying, and, and uh, coming to terms with the fact that death, death is inevitable. You two guys know I had a very powerful dream three weeks ago about what it meant to die and about uh, wanting a, a real immortality project. And I'm going to share this dream now with the other people who are following me. And I'll get into some of the meanings I've extracted from it if I have time to do that. This was a, a very lucid and powerful dream. I dreamed of, on the night of August 23rd, 2020, 2021. It was so powerful, so moving, and so full of rich detail that I saw so lucidly that I decided I had to write it down and do something with it. Uh, now, as a general background comment, uh, I dream I think, I can't remember a night when I do not dream. I dream all the time. I have at least one dream every evening. And since like aging male, I have to get up in the middle of the night to uh, go relieve myself. I often have more than one dream a night. And usually in the morning, as I come up out of sleep and uh, wake to wakefulness, I do remember not all the details, but I do remember the, the main thrust of those dreams. And I do spend a few minutes musing to myself, what am I trying to tell myself with this dream? What, what's it all about? And then I go about my business. I never write them down and they don't stay with me for very long. If, if you asked me three days later, what I dreamed three nights ago, I probably wouldn't know, but I, I could recreate this dream in infinite detail again if somebody asked me to do it. So here's the dream. 
It's about death and it's about immortality. I am milling around with others in a large space in a hospital. My wife, my younger daughter, and her two children, my grandchildren, are with me along with scientists and hospital personnel. The others are all here either just to create or to bear witness to what is about to happen and to keep me company. I am about to be admitted to and receive the benefits of a new, quote, immortality project, close quotes, developed by the government. The award of being allowed to be among the first to participate in the Immortality Project has been given to me because one, I was elderly and will not live too much longer. And two, because I have been evaluated thoroughly and have been found to be a kind and useful person who has made some good contributions to life on earth. Therefore, I'm going to be allowed to make sure that within the bounds of present technology now about to be tested, some of what defines me will be allowed to live on beyond my death. I know that the mechanism for attempting to achieve this objective is just in its earliest stages of development. For now and for me today, a male infant has been cloned from another infant and is waiting for biological interactions that are to take place between myself and the little one that will shape the infant to be closer to a replica of myself as that self was at the time of my birth. The infant is brought for me to see. He looks both a little restless and quite beautiful. I am told that after the transactions and physiological adjustments to come, he will be known as Arthur L. Kovacs II. An exploration and mapping of his DNA and mine are then made. Those in charge decide that for the baby to develop with a physical makeup that closely resembles my endowments, some gene splicing needs to be done to bring him into better confluence with my biological substrate. Of course, I understand that nurture will determine the greatest part of his future unfolding as he grows and develops, but the rules of the project are that he needs to start life with as much of the same equipment as did I when I started. It does not take long to adjust the baby to my makeup. Now I am, been, now I am told that the scientists are just beginning to learn how to implant imagery into the consciousness of humans. I am asked to describe the three most important things that I would like to pass on to the infant to serve as dreams to beckon my new younger self onward as he develops. It takes me a moment of pausing before I'm able to specify that. But I come up with to have the courage to love deeply to believe that the lot of the human race can be improved and that he has a responsibility to make at least some tiny part of that betterment happen. And third, to live with integrity, always even when surrounded by sloth, stupidity, deviousness, and or corruption. After I have specified the three orienting principles, a metal headgear is put over the infant's head and connected to many leads on a large piece of electronic equipment. A scientist inputs instructions on a keyboard. Lights flash and one of the technicians announces that the guiding principles I have enunciated are now encoded into the infant. Next, I am told that a very special young couple has been selected and has agreed to adopt the baby, make him their son and raise him on into the future. These volunteers are both graduate students. They are a heterosexual couple. In the questionnaire I had filled out about my earlier life, I had indicated that in adolescence, I was uncertain whether I wanted to be a nuclear physicist or a novelist. So the two parents who are now going to be parents of my baby's ongoing self 
are presently both enrolled in university doctorate programs where they met, he in Russian literature and she in theoretical physics. They come through a side door leading into the large room, pick up the baby and cuddle him, and come over to introduce themselves to me. After hearing about and meeting the new family, I am then instructed that, as had been told to me when I received the reward, all was now ready and in order. Therefore, I would die within 30 minutes. But I could die content, knowing that important fragments of me would live on in the personhood of the child who would grow, develop, and hopefully make some kind of significant future contribution to the ongoing evolution of the species. I felt profoundly sad that my own life was ending, but I wanted to love and to cheer on my successor. I hugged and kissed him. I cried saying goodbye to my wife, my daughter, and my grandchildren. And I went into an adjourning room to sleep and to die. As I lay down, I remembered how one decade of my life was particularly lonely and difficult one for me, my adolescence. Of course, my father had just died, but trying to become, learning about the path to adulthood, readying myself to leave home, struggling with sexuality and intimate human relatedness, and learning how to learn elegantly. Every one of those challenges at times felt so overwhelming, and I was so lonely during those years. As I went to sleep and to die, I wished for my tiny surrogate that he might have a much more gracious passage through his adolescence than I had through mine. Then I woke up and started crying. Okay, I'll turn the floor over to you two guys. Maybe there's something new you didn't tell me about the first time around. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when you're done, I'll take some time to talk about my ongoing attempt to extract meaning out of this dream. Go ahead. You know, Arthur, I, I believe that, that you've already oh, provided for your Im immortality by what you've done with your teaching, your therapy, and your uh, consultation with other um, clinicians. So in some ways that you've left a piece of yourself, a part of yourself with all of these people throughout many years. So in, in some ways you don't need the, the clone Yes, I do, because that's only <laughs> that only is passing on fragments of my consciousness. I have managed to uh, help people to feel better about their lives. I've helped impart some wisdom to, to colleagues, clients, friends, family. I've managed to support them and give them kindness. And I've implanted a whole bunch of things that I know for some number of people they will continue to re to remember ongoing but i have not done the basic uh i don't know if it's uh, jung would probably appreciate this the basic thing of making sure my dna was immortal and by uh, by the the appearance of the clone baby who then had his his dna adjusted to match my dna that's a part of the immortality that uh, I, I'm now achieving in the dream that I will never achieve in real life because I think you guys know I have no biological children. I have stepchildren and adopted children. So I think one, uh, and I know, uh, well, Aaron, do you want to say anything before I take over again? No, no, go ahead. Okay. I know I've told you, and I don't know there are listeners who haven't heard this, that my dear witch wife uh, did the most beautiful thing imaginable to me on my 40th birthday. We got married when I was 39, and she was 34. And so I suddenly turned 40 at last. And that night when we were going to bed after having a little birthday party, 
she said, I have an extra gift for you. And I said, what's the gift? She said, would you like to try and start making a baby tonight? I think I may be fertile. And I said, what? I thought it never even crossed my mind. What the hell is she talking about? And she said, well, no, I mean it. it it's been very meaningful to me to look at my children, to know they, they are my kinship. They are out of my body. They are part of me. And my DNA is in them. And you haven't had that experience. You have only my stepdaughters that you're raising here and your own adopted children. And if it would mean something to you to have a biological child, please think about it. And I'm willing, I'm young enough, I'm willing to do that for you. I don't need to do it. I, I'm, I'm content with my lot. But if it would mean something to you, I'm up for it. We'll, we'll have a fifth child. So I, I had a restless night's sleep that night. When I got up in the morning, I had done my calculus at intermittent moments. I said, that is probably the most beautiful thing anybody ever offered to me. But no, there are a thousand reasons why not to do it. That would be a kind of crazy vanity project. Oh, now I have my biological child. It's going to be very special because at least half of it has my biology. And it'd be very special because the other half of it has your biology. But I don't need to do that. Jesus Christ, your former husband is a flake. We never know when he's going to pay child support. I'm on the hook for a big divorce settlement. I have to divest myself of lots of money for my former wife and for my children. It's very expensive to have four children already. And you know, at least three of them are very, very bright. We're probably cursed. They're probably all gonna to go to graduate school. So they're not gonna become economically independent at a very young age either. And we've been fucked seven times around because we didn't discover each other until we were well into our thirties. I was almost 40. We never got a chance to be carefree young adults and have a whole bunch of crazy adventures with each other when we were young. We are trapped in domesticity and there's no way to end it easily. We suppose we could put all the kids up for adoption again, but we're not gonna do that. So we have to always ask ourselves, what are we about to do? And, What's the effect on the children going to do? And now what do we have to do to take care of the children if we want to do that? But the one good thing is I, both of us had our children young and we will get liberated somewhere in our 50s or early 60s, depending on how long they go to school. And I hope we'll be in good health and we won't have children to raise anymore. And we'll be able to go where we please, when we please and do what we want, what we want. That, that feels very precious to me. That's much more precious than having a biological child. So the answer is no, but I love you. And uh, I went on with my business and she wouldn't let it go. Uh, every year until she started to become menopausal, she would raise it on my birthday again. Are you sure you don't want to have a biological child? And I would visit the topic again in good faith, try it on again. And to my horror, I discovered it was becoming harder and harder to say no as I was getting older and older. I was beginning to feel the yearning to do it. And that continued. And when she was finally menopausal and the possibility of siring of, of a child with her had evaporated forever, I began to think even more, about why did I do that? I was filled with regrets. I had crazy daydreams that uh, maybe I should just masturbate and give semen to a sperm bank. Maybe somebody else will make use of my DNA if I turned away at the wrong time from doing it myself like an idiot I was hard on myself and scolding myself and you saw how I had that fantasy of keeping my father alive that he had gotten a corpse and substituted it for himself I I had fantasies of my children that never got born I had I had a male imagined son and I had a female imagined daughter they were angry at me for not having been the portal through which they came to life on earth. And I had to try and talk them out of being angry at me. I, was, I took great pains to tell them all the things that were shitty about what was going on on earth and why they should feel relieved that they were wherever they were and didn't have to put up with what the rest of us were putting up with. The baby was better for them. 
And then so I, sometimes I indulge myself in imagining about how old they would be. And I did talk to them about, well, you can't come here, but let me tell you what I imagined doing with you if you were here and why I'm missing it maybe as much as you are. So I carried on a fantasy relationship with both my son and my daughter. Funny enough, at about the age when they would have been leaving home, that daydream stopped. I haven't had it recently at all. Maybe I ought to go back and revisit it. So clearly this damn dream, part of it is a, an attempt to work out that, that undone regret that I have in myself for not having had biological children. I give myself close to death when I'm very old. I give myself something akin to that. My DNA is going to go on in another body at last. Well, I won't get a chance to enjoy the experience of raising that child. I have to turn them over, the child over to surrogate parents, little tiny Arthur coming, Arthur the second who's gonna come, but Arthur the second will exist. And God damn it, it's, it's fucked too, because I won't be able to experience the con stream of consciousness of that entity uh, as it evolves and becomes. I, it's only a very partial victory I'm getting. I know there's a person there who will be a clone of me in some ways and will live a life ongoing, but I won't have the experiential knowledge of what the journey is for him. That pisses me off too. Maybe in one of uh, Aaron's alternative universes, that kind of experience is commonplace. I don't know. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> <laughs> could be yes Aaron uh, are there any uh, sperm banks that accept uh, uh, sperm uh, to hold for uh, another 50 or 100 years that's, that's, that's an interesting future? idea almost like that like uh, the cryogenic thing that people do where they freeze their head or their body oh for, uh, yeah, for, uh, yeah sperm does get, sperm does get frozen yeah. yeah, you can do okay. that. Eggs get frozen. Yeah, sperm <laughs> uh -huh. gets frozen we too. Should, we should look into that. Look into that. <laughs> you know, when, when my children were born, um, uh, the uh, we uh, I guess we're still preserving uh, the uh, umbilical cord. Oh, yeah, we do. We do that too. The uh, yeah. the, the um, oh, so you get the stem so cells. So you get the stem cells out of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're still preserving that. And, and it's, you know, what, what, uh, 20 some odd years later. Yeah. yeah, yeah. but you're preserving that for the well-being of the, uh, uh, the child that belongs to that umbilicus. There's no benefit to you. If the child, God right. forbid, needs a uh, stem cell transplant, you can harvest it from the umbilical cord. You know. And sometimes the other other siblings can have some benefit, possibly. And it's an evolving field. There, there might even be some backward compatibility towards parents too. Maybe oh, there's possible. Th yeah. there's some hope for your sperm still, uh, Arthur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got some. I got some spare room in my freezer. One of the ice trays is empty. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a power shortage, that's not a good thing. I think I, mm. I think the, the banks that are uh, that have frozen human tissue in them have backup generators. Do you have backup <laughs> generators? <laughs> I that that would be real. terrible, <laughs> uh, Aaron. If, if if one night in some ways uh, that you you use that for yeah. some oh. uh, uh, no, diet no. coke or something, you know. <laughs> Humor is an excellent. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's one of the Freud felt it was one of the most sophisticated defenses. Against uh, facing this mortality. Yeah. <laughs> the the other thing that's obvious too is I I, I keep saying to myself I I've, I've made reasonable peace of, about dying. Uh, I I know what I believe is true. Uh, it's I I hope I don't have to suffer for a long period of time, but I, I will eventually come to the precipice of death. There will be organ failures, or, or I may be in intractable pain and choosing to commit suicide, which is now allowable. So when I finally cross the divide from uh, living to being dead, I believe 
the story of the people who've had near-death experiences. I have this romantic notion, my brain will secrete something that will allow me to hallucinate something comforting in the last uh, instance, the last moments before death. But then I believe everything goes black. I don't believe I'm gonna rejoin my relatives or go off to the top of Mount Whitney where the view is beautiful and everybody I love will be up there with me. No, none of that's gonna happen. I may have a momentary daydream of it, but it's gonna be black and I'm gonna cease to exist. My atoms are gonna be immortal. They, even when the sun explodes and the earth is burned into a cinder, the atoms I made up uh, will, will become part of what's burning in the furnace and rearranging and, and swirling around. So my atoms are immortal. I don't have anything that I believe is an immortal soul. So I, the, the dream suggests I'm not quite at peace with that, even though I say I am. My conceit to myself, I'm at peace with that. I find it sad. I, I like my stream of consciousness. It's my personal friend in some way. And I, I cry that we're gonna be separated and not connected to each other anymore. So I do mourning. I'm mourning the loss of self periodically. I cry about it, but it's supposedly it's been okay. The dream suggests it's not quite okay. I'm, I'm in part of what Kubler-Ross calls bargaining. Yeah, all right, I'll go die. I'll go to the room and just die. But I have to have a more important immortality project than I have a current first. <laughs> Give me a better immortality project and I'll go die in much greater peace. Mm -hmm. Good old bargaining. <laughs> oh, and then there's that superstitious part of me saying, great, you know what? Maybe that's why you're living so long. You're, you're cussedly refusing to die until there is a better immortality project for you. Until it gets invented or you discover it or something mm -hmm. happens to give you a better immortality project, then you'll be able to rest and feel like you'll just surrender to what's coming. Now you've heard all of, no, that's not true. It's not all. You've heard a slice of the craziness of Arthur L. Kovacs. <laughs> <laughs> well, your, your YouTube channel is on its way to immortality, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, that's right. It's probably going to stay in cyber uh, cyberspace for God knows what. Is anybody a thousand years from now going to be looking at old YouTube channels? Uh, you know, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> As a historical anth document. Yeah, anthropologists have a wonderful yeah. set of residues. They don't have to look, look at pot fragments to see what was yeah. going on at other times and places. Exactly. Hmm. What would be a kind of like your your most peaceful thought in in regard to um, your your dying, Arthur? My Not. most peaceful thought. <laughs> well, you, well, well, in, in some ways, what would give you um, um, comfort? Oh, uh, uh, death would come in the following way: I would be living essentially as I am now. I'm, I'm reasonably vital. I'm slowed down a little, and I. I have some crotchets of things that bother me, but not much. And I can essentially live most of the fullness of whatever life I've been used to living for many decades now. And then in the middle of the night, I, just like my father died, I, I would prefer a cerebral aneurysm to blow because I don't think there's much pain, if any, with that. And I wouldn't even wake up. I'd just be dead. And I wouldn't even know I was dead because there would be no me to know that I was dead. Hmm. I would like I, I say that about some people. I, I hear how they died. And I, I'm usually saying, you know, that was a very nice death, actually. The problem is it came much too early in their life. But your father didn't get a chance to say goodbye to you. No. And in, yeah, in that I respect, well, yeah, I'm, you... I'm being selfish. I, I would like to die in a way that's <laughs> peaceful, peaceful and takes good care of me. And I know that'll make wrenching problems for the people I'm connected to. They'll be shocked. It'll be sudden. The best death for the guys staying behind are people who die after long and terrible lingering cancer. 
because it's clear that death is coming, the mourning goes on endlessly. Every time you go visit them, you walk out of the room and start crying because you know they're dying. So you do a lot of the grief work before they're even dead. And when they're finally dead, there's greater peacefulness. They're out of their misery. And you can feel more at peace and not as tragic as you, you, you have to go through. But sudden deaths are terrible for people. At almost every age, and if it's a child, it's even more horrible. Or you can but, put your your uh, your your goodbyes in a safe deposit box. I already have. Oh, there's a there's a, I have a a, a file on uh, every desktop of the few computers we have, and particularly on my wife's computer. It's it's the emergency file. What to what to do in a crisis, and one of them is all my thoughts that uh, since I've died, I haven't expressed fully enough to her. It's there. Mm. Okay. I revise it periodically based on changing circumstances. Mm. I've never told her it's there. I just told her, I, showed her I, j I just showed her the file and said, there, there, everything you, you're gonna need to know is in there. Very responsible dead guy. <laughs> yeah <laughs> or a live guy who's not dead yeah. yet yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. well you don't have some of these problems Aaron because uh, you've not created a new family but you, you do have uh, some relatives I, I assume and you certainly have a son that's going to be affected by your passing yeah yeah Oh, I'll, I'll be a scold. Do you have all your ducks in a row? Do you have all your papers in order? All the, do you have a will? Do you have a, a advanced directive for taking care of you? Yeah. All that good stuff? Someone else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be, by law, it's going to be, if your son has turned 18, it's going to be his problem. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, I have some basic stuff in place. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I have some people I've put in charge in case something goes sideways and Oh, yeah. thank you. That's good. Yeah. Thank you for being responsible. All right, Scott, I know you need to get on to other things. So I think I've said everything about everything that I wanted to today. I don't have to dangle over to next week. So I have next week to think about what I want to do next week. Okay. Great. All right. Have a good walk, Arthur. Have, have a good thank you. That's what we're headed okay. off for. All right. Bye. Bye. Be well. <laughs> Bye, guys.